Homes RI is a coalition of organizations working together to increase the supply of safe, healthy, and affordable homes throughout Rhode Island. Hopefully these interviews will bring insights to the need and work. For more information or to get involved, visit homesri.org. My name is Eric Hirsch. Uh, I'm a professor of sociology at Providence College, and I do a lot of work on the issue of homelessness and have been for around 35 years. My mother and her father in particular were very progressive and particularly, you know, this was in the 60s when the civil rights movement and the black power movements were very active. So despite the fact that I was in a almost exclusively white area in terms of where I lived and the school I went to, I became very interested in uh, the anti-racist movement and I've really been active in that uh, my whole adult life. You know, inspired, I mean, Malcolm X, maybe some people would be surprised to learn that I was inspired by Malcolm X. But if you follow his life and his relationship to the nation of Islam and particularly late in his life, um, I think maybe you would have a better understanding of why I would find him inspiring. In fact, when I was uh, teaching at Columbia University, the university uh, decided they wanted to take over the Audubon Ballroom, which is in fact where Malcolm X was killed and where many of his last speeches were made. And they were gonna use it as a biotech center. And so I um, started a movement uh, to prevent them from doing that. And it was successful as long as I was at Columbia. After I left, they managed to do that. And so the Audubon Ballroom now is a biotech facility with a small, oh, cool. muse a small museum to Malcolm X in the ground floor. So I, I went to Bucknell University, again, largely white environment, but uh, was very much um, inspired by the new left. There was a radical economics department there, the Union for Radical Political Economics. Almost everyone in that department was part of that. Um, and also a former Students for a Democratic Society advisor at Princeton came to the sociology department. And so as a result of that, I decided I really was interested in uh, working on black urban poverty and trying to do something about that. And when I went to the University of Chicago, I started working on a project on housing abandonment in a you know, almost exclusively black neighborhood on the South side. Um, and I got involved in tenant organizing at the same time. Uh, this was at the University of Chicago where I went to grad school. So really the University of Chicago and Chicago, that was my introduction to these issues. And uh, I've been active ever since. I will say, uh, you know, then I taught at Columbia for eight years and um, I was also involved in a tenant union there and tenant organizing was really what I was doing for about 20 years. When I got to Rhode Island, I found that there weren't any tenant unions, <laughs> you know, which is really unusual. And I'm not sure exactly why someone should really look into this and figure out why there's so little tenant organizing. Uh, right now, we're starting to do some more of that, I know. And uh, I'm trying to participate in that. Um, but partly because there wasn't any tenant organizing going on, I got involved in uh, dealing with homelessness. And I've been doing that for maybe 25 or 30 years. Yeah, home is a safe place. And, you know, that's more meaningful now than ever with the COVID-19 crisis. It's a place that's safe. It's a place, I, I forget who said this, but 
it's a place where they have to take you in, you know, if you need a place to stay. So you can't be turned away because it's your home. So we have, uh, we ha I think it's important to understand that we have had successes, you know, with regard to homelessness. So back um, almost 20 years ago now, we created something called the Neighborhood Opportunities Program. And that was the first time that the state really put significant resources into any kind of housing program. And the Password Island had pretty much just passed through uh, federal resources through Rhode Island Housing, you know, which is a quasi public agency. Uh, and the state had really done nothing with regard to housing, and they still don't do very much. But we got them to create the Neighborhood Opportunities Program, which built new units of housing for people with very low income, generally people who are uh, previously homeless, uh, and also provided support services. So it was a permanent supportive housing program run by the state. Um, we got $5 million into this early on, and then a recession hit. And at that point, the program was immediately cut. It was the first state program cut. So it was right around Thanksgiving and Christmas time. And so we encouraged, you know, that was their mistake, I think. And we encouraged um, five ministers to stage a protest in the state room, which is part of the governor's office. And they refused to leave when asked to leave when the uh, state house shut down that night. It was the night of the Christmas tree lighting in the state house. And so they were arrested. And I was pretty much the organizer of this whole thing. And I had several TV stations and the Providence Journal there when they were arrested. They, they were let out holding hands, singing Joy to the World, uh, five ministers. And that was just played over and over and over on TV. And we not only got the 5 million back, but they added another 5 million for the following year. I would say the National Coalition for the Homeless is one of those groups. Um, they're mainly people who've experienced homelessness, who, are, who run that organization. And that one thing that I think Rhode Island uh, has a problem with is uh, its lack of respect for self-advocacy groups. Uh, you know, a lot of what we do with regard to advocacy is run by uh, people in various nonprofit organizations. I would be one of those people also. When there's self-advocacy groups, so, you know, in this case, people who've experienced homelessness, they are often viewed as troublemakers. They're often viewed as people who are raising questions that shouldn't be raised. When I think the truth is the exact opposite, that they are the people who should be listened to most of all. Uh, so groups like DARE certainly have inspired me. I've worked with DARE for 30 years. Uh, I've known all of the key community leaders in DARE and you know, still work with a lot of them. Uh, so locally, I would certainly list them at, at the top. But again, the self-advocacy group, so People to End Homelessness, which is no longer around, Catherine Rhodes, who was, uh, you know, formerly homeless and the leader of that group, uh, Dave St. Germain, John Joyce, uh, Barbara Freitas, um, John Freitas, also no longer with us, um, Bill Chamberlain. So it's a self-advocacy groups, and I would put DARE in that category. You know, that it's taken us decades to figure out how to end homelessness. And now we know exactly what to do. And that's the housing first model where you put someone in a home and then you provide them with, with whatever support they need to stay there. It's simple. It actually is cost effective because you spend less money on Medicaid and all sorts of other services. Uh, Department of Corrections and so on, but we can't seem to develop the will to make this happen. 
So something as simple as source of income discrimination. So let's say you have a housing choice voucher or a state rental subsidy, and you go to a landlord and say, I've got this subsidy, uh, I'd like to rent. And they say, no, I don't rent to anyone who has a subsidy. That should be illegal. There are plenty of other reasons why they could find, you know, they could find to not rent to a person. But right now it's legal to turn people down or even put, you know, no Section 8, no rental subsidies in your ads. It's still legal to do that. We've gotten away from uh, protest strategies. You know, we've been trying to play the inside game for so long now that we've lost our real source of power. I mean, the real source of power, you know, there's a great book called Poor People's Movements uh, that talks about, well, the only resource that poor people really have is protest. You know, so trying to stop the wheels of the machine that is oppressing people through civil disobedience, like, like we did with the ministers who took over the governor's office. If we hadn't done that, that program would have been cut. We never would have gotten it back. Now we think, you know, we can just go in and lobby the speaker, um, you know, lobby other powerful leaders in the General Assembly or the governor. But that isn't the way politics works now. So I think really what we need to do is to go back to protest strategies um, as opposed to simply trying to work the inside game. I'm not saying we should abandon the inside game because once the protest puts pressure on the leadership or the governor, then I think you need the inside game to try to implement the changes. But if you give up on you know, going outside routine means of influence, you've given up the main source of power that you have. The scale of it is never the scale that's needed to actually solve the problems, whether it's homelessness or whether it's the percent of income that people are paying for their rent. It's just never anywhere close to what we actually need. I mean, an example is the 1.5 million that was put into helping people with their rent during this crisis. That, that was gone in minutes. I mean, that's, it's almost insulting, the level of that. So we just don't have the political power to force uh, the scale that's needed to deal with homelessness or, um, you know, low-income renters not being able to afford their rent. Project-based uh, housing, you know, project-based Section 8 is an example of what you can do, is to have uh, whole buildings where the subsidy is um, in the unit rather than, uh, you know, portable, you know, because landlords aren't going to take people. So, yeah, it's, it's the obvious solution. The problem with that is usually there are 30-year leases and then a lot of times the owners will take them into the private sector after that 30 years. Although I will say, at least in Rhode Island, Rhode Island housing has been really good at making sure that those are renewed. So we do have those in Rhode Island already. And it's to the credit of Rhode Island housing that they have gotten those 30 year leases renewed. So yeah, that's exactly what we should be doing at this point is creating um, buying buildings or building them and making sure that all of those units are subsidized. They should organize to go outside of the routine political system uh, and use protest to get the power that they need. Mm -hmm.